Hi, everyone online and in person. Welcome to the second part of the IFR Flying series. This is IFR Flying into Monterey. The first part is IFR Flying to Half Moon Bay, and the last one is Watsonville. And these recordings are being published on YouTube for uh, your viewing later on if you're interested. Just a disclaimer that these are my personal views for educational purposes, and the plates and the procedures are constantly being updated. So whenever you start flying, uh, these procedures, make sure you use the most updated procedures. The last one is going to be next Saturday. It's um, Saturday from 1 to 3, IFR flying into Watsonville. So for those who are interested in FA Wings credit, I've created an easy way for you to get that. I'll display two coded phrase in the middle and at the end of the session. So if uh, you can complete the form, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash IFR Monterey, all lowercase, that will send you to a Google form link. And that allows you to put in your information. This helps me give people credit, wings credit really quickly because we have a lot of people who join. And so it allows me to, a bulk of loading a file if uh, you're into Excel stuff. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to individually do it one by one, which is quite difficult. So wings credit, filled in the form bit.ly slash IFR Monterey. A little bit about me. For those who have joined last week, you might have heard I teach single engine, multi-engine airplane, um, uh, CFI, double I, MEI. I mostly train accelerated advanced training, so instrument, commercial, CFI, CFII, multi, and commercial, multi-engine, add-on, MEI training. My ideal students is our students who are disciplined and dedicated because I love students who want to go fast and far. So my kind of training is we do hard stuff. <laughs> we do challenging stuff that you might not do on your own uh, so that when you fly on your own, it's child's play. Right? So we do hard stuff. It's fast paced and it's advanced training. Um, the way that I train my students is I make really complex ideas simple. And you're going to see how that translates into IFR training as well. But sometimes I have pilots who take what I've made simple back to complicated. And a lot of time I remind them, hey, this is really simple. Um, here's today's flight plan. The first one, we're going to talk about why you should fly in Monterey, all the cool stuff that I've discovered that you might know as well. Why you might want to fly IFAR into Monterey. We're going to do a Monterey accident case analysis that happened a few years ago. We're going to review the key principle that I talk about in IFAR, the, key, the three keys questions. If you listened last week, this is a review. Uh, we'll talk about Monterey approaches and departures and lost calm scenarios and how you might think through how to handle these scenarios. So first, why fly to Monterey? Monterey is an airport that's close to a place that I love, Carmel by the beach, where there are these quaint little village cottage shops. There's tremendous beauty. The scenic route is incredible. You can see the mountains juxtaposed with the oceans, the greens with the blues. There's the Monterey Bay Aquarium on Cannery Row. There's the Monterey Harbor, Old Fisherman's Harbor. And that's where you can have dinners on these beautiful lakeside ocean front view. And Aerodynamic is also located in Monterey. Now we have we have moved into a jet center. It's MPI Jet Center. It's a very beautiful location. If you fly aerodynamic airplane at San Jose, you know that at San Jose location, we sell fuel using a fuel truck. But if you fly to Monterey at the Monterey Aerodynamic location, there's a fueler <laughs> and the person fuel for you, which is great. I love that feature. <laughs> I don't like climbing up to the airplane wing and doing my fuel. It's kind of heavy for me. The fuel host is a really beautiful vista, um, really great place to get sandwiches, restaurants, seafood, beaches, mountains, uh, aquarium. Here's the view. 
some of the most scenic flights that I've had is flying across the Santa Cruz to Monterey coastline. This is a stunning, gorgeous view, seeing the coastline curves around. If you are taking passengers for the first time flying around, I love taking people toward the Monterey Santa Cruz area. Everyone loves that transition from mountains to ocean. The color change is gorgeous. So that's where I take people on discovery flight. I think it's quite exciting for people to see that. This is why I fly IFR into Monterey. This is a flight that happened recently, just within the, the past few weeks. But we would be flying into the valley, and it's a little bit hazy, just a little bit of clouds. And then suddenly, you go into solid, complete IMC. You can't see anything. And oftentimes in Monterey, you might see that. Monterey is located near the coastline, so there's the marine layers that often come. And it'll come in the morning, and it'll come in the afternoon, late afternoon. So if you fly in the middle of the day when it's really hot, the marine layer in the clouds gets burned off. But usually early morning or afternoon, the layers start coming in. And it can be solid IMC for a, a bit. Sometimes the layer is 3,000 feet, sometimes it's 1,000 feet, sometimes it's a quick 500 feet. But even a short layer, the stint of cloud or haze or low visibility can be quite dangerous. So we'll talk about this idea of VFR into IMC. I mentioned this last week, but 86% of non-commercial fixed wing aircraft, as usually GA airplanes uh, that are fatal, accidents are caused by VFR into IMC. And what's really interesting is about a third of these accidents are involving instrument rated pilots. So even if you do have, have an IFR rating, and that's not a get out of jail free card. You still need to maintain proficiency. You still need to maintain currency. And here's why that's really important at Monterey specifically. Now, the image on the left is the image of Google Map. This is the topography image. You have the ocean to your north. To the east is relatively flat land, but it does rise up to mountains um, more further to the east. To the west and to the south are mountainous region. Here you also see a sectional chart from the FA. The yellow means it's rising terrain. Green means flat land on the image on the right. So you do see that there are mountainous terrain coming up from the south, going toward the west as you're entering Monterey. So let's talk about an accident that happened in Monterey involving a IFR pilot. This happened July 13, 2021. And we'll discuss this and also risk management, how we might manage these risks. So there were two people in the airplane and a little dog, a Dashun. Here's the NTSB report. So before taking off, the pilot canceled IFR and requested a VFR on top clearance. She was issued the Monterey 5 departure procedure and that procedure included a left turn after takeoff. The pilot took off, the plane climbed 818 feet, and then started a right-hand turn. So remember, the clearance is to turn left. The plane entered a right-hand turn. Air traffic controller noticed this. And by the way, air traffic controller is your best friend. And I know this because high flown airplanes on autopilot. And the moment the autopilot fail and the plane deviate just for two seconds, air traffic controller had caught that deviation while we, the pilots in the airplane, was noticing there was something wrong with our autopilot. So ATC is incredibly good at notice, noticing any deviation that happened. So in this case, the controller noticed a deviation and he gave her continue right turn, go back to 030 because he noticed that she was turning toward the mountains. And then whenever an aircraft is at low altitude on the radar for the air traffic controller, there's a symbol, a warning that says low terrain. So the air traffic controller told this aircraft, hey, there's a low terrain alert climb, make sure you climb. And the pilot didn't respond. 
at this point, the ceiling was 800 feet AGO, right? That's, that was the overcast, but people in the area were saying that the clouds might have gone down to 700 AGO. The terrain uh, is about 150, 200 feet elevation. And there was a previous pilot report that the tops of clouds are 2,000 feet. So you can assume that the cloud layer is about 1,000 feet cloud layer. Yeah, was the was the departure runway um, one zero? One zero. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I'm going to show an image really quick. Great question. So when the NTSB analyzed the airplane, they determined that there was nothing wrong with the plane. The plane was flying just fine. The airplane was climbing right turn happened shortly after the airplane entered IMC into the cloud, and the pilot was acknowledging a frequency change and trying to contact the next controller and acknowledging the heading instruction. So here's the conclusion from NTSB. The pilot didn't have the instrument currency requirements and was likely not proficient. And because of this lack of recent experience and a momentary distraction of trying to change the radio, it contributed to spatial disorientation and loss of airplane control. So I'm gonna tell you two, occasions that happened when I was teaching my own students and we're flying into actual IMC for the first time. So one student, this is his first time ever flying into IMC. The moment we got close to the ground and close to the clouds as we're descending into a layer of clouds, this pilot, private rated, lots of hours, lots of experience in his own airplane, start pulling back the yoke, banking left, and pulling the power. So imagine we are now pitching up, climbing, and the pilot is killing the power. So I'm telling the pilot, stop doing that, straighten the wings, lower the nose, fly, descend, add power. No response. This pilot was frozen. So I wrestled the control out of his pilot's hand and put the plane back to where it's supposed to be, wings level, descending into the clouds. Uh, another scenario that happened, and this happened in Watsonville, I'll discuss more in details in the next wing seminar. This is an instrument rated pilot, just got the instrument rating and did this departure procedure at Watsonville just a month ago, passed the check ride. On the departure, misread the departure procedure start putting the plane in a turn and kept turning and didn't stop turning. So air traffic controller noticed something was wrong and they gave a heading change, just like in the scenario, why this heading? This pilot was so surprised and also gets nervous by the fact that he might have deviated from the departure procedure that he stared at the heading indicator and fixated on that put the airplane in the 60 degrees bank, descending. So we're now initiating a steep spiral. I took over, leveled a wing, kept us climbing. Air traffic controller is saying, like in the scenario, confirm that you're climbing. We start climbing out, pop out of the cloud, pilot returns to normal. But in the moment that we went into the cloud, froze and start doing these really weird things. So a lot of time people will go through the instrument training, mostly in the foggles, rarely, if ever, they fly in actual IMC. Now the moment that you go into actual IMC, you might be like many other pilots, do weird things in actual IMC. So if you're doing your training, make sure that you have actual IMC experience. If you haven't done that before, make sure you fly with someone who's very highly experienced, been inside a solid lair before and know what to do to rescue and save. Because in my opinion, for those two scenarios, if those two were pilots were left alone, the plane and the pilots would not be here today. It was yeah, a very the, dangerous situation. Yeah. example, example here with pilots you know, the wrong thing. And, and there was a frequency change right there. That frequency change would have been instructed by your head or who was also telling them to do the 360 to go zero three zero. Mm -hmm. Wasn't the controller then contributing to the situation by further distracting the pilot? 
So the question for people online is the controller is telling them to change frequency, change heading, and wasn't they contributing to the accident? Uh, usually on a departure, you should expect that there is a frequency change. That's the normal IFR procedure. Um, so the combination of the pilot not being proficient at this moment, and I'm going to show you why there's more data that comes up, and we'll see what's happening. Yeah. yeah but the pilot, I mean, the ATC controller knows something's wrong. Yes. Not, this person is not following. The right. Yep. And so, like the stories that I'm telling you, even when the controller knows something is wrong, is telling the pilot, or there's an instructor next to the pilot telling the pilot what to do, the overwhelming sensation of being in solid IMC, if you're not used to it, is so incredibly powerful that it's really hard to get out of it. I guess my point was why would the controller just say, stay with me? make sure that you know things are back to normal before so, I say change frequency. Well they say change frequency, but then so they change frequency. And then the pilot start turning in the wrong direction. So that controller is saying, why this heading? Climb up. Confirm that you're climbing. Make sure you're, I'm re receiving low altitude alert. Okay. So uh, I have a question about the uh, canceling the IFR flight plan and mm -hmm. the VFR on top, because I think the VFR on top is normally issued as a part of IFR flight plan, and an IFR departure by itself requires an IFR clearance, mm -hmm. so wouldn't, doesn't that conflict with the idea of canceling the IFR flight plan? Yeah, so the question is, um, why would she cancel the IFR flight plan and then request VFR on top? Because that's usually part of the IFR flight plan. And that's exactly the question that I have too. So let me just keep going and share with you more information about what happened on this day. The wind was 280 at seven knots. So she's taking off from runway 10. She's accepting a tailwind. Uh, what people were saying is it could be that usually in Monterey, the clouds is on one end of the airport, like on the west side, but on the east side is clear. So she's accepting a tailwind departure, and there's a little bit of cloud where one zero is, but two H, you can see that is clear. And that would explain why she might have asked for a VFR on top, even though she should be an IFR flight plan. And the other reason why she might have canceled IFR flight plans is because she's not current. So let's talk about the departure. So she's taken off on runway one zero, and the procedure is turn left, climbing turn, heading three two nine er, and then intercept Salinas, the radio westbound to Shui intersection. Here's what actually happened. So she took off on runway one zero, and for some reason the NTSB is concluding that it's probably because she entered IMC and got spatially disoriented and started climbing turn. And then there was this distraction of changing frequency, which is a, a normal thing. Anytime we do a departure, you are asked to change frequency from tower to NorCal. And th this distraction adds to this loss of control. So here's the aircraft before the accident. The aircraft ended up crashing a little bit from the runway into a house. Luckily, no one was in the house at that time. And the Linkage of the aircraft was spread over a wide area. Here's what we know about the pilot. So you might think, oh, maybe this is a student pilot. Maybe it's a newly minted instrument rated pilot. No, this is an ATP rated commercial pilot. Single engine land, single engine sea, multi engine land, also CFI, CFII, MEI, and had 9,337 hours at the time. Thousands of hours, 74 years old at the time, lots of experience. But what people were noticing was while the pilot was getting the taxi clearance and radio calls, she was fumbling on a radio. Um, people said it sounded like she was stressed. In the preceding 12 months, the NTSB determined that the pilot only had 0.3 hours of simulate instrument time. 0.7 hours of actual instrument instrument flight time and no instrument approaches. So for her to be current, she needs 
six instrument approaches, a hold, etc. In addition to that, there was external pressure or external factors that could have contributed to the external pressure. So the pilot was flying her friend. Her friend had stopped driving her for a while because of a brain injury. And her friend wanted to go see her son who was about to do a medical procedure. So there was a mission in this flight was she needed to get someplace on time for to help her friend um, be with her son during the medical procedures. And the other aspect is she was flying a Cessna 421 Charlie, which is a, a lot of people say it's a difficult plane to handle. It's a twin engine. The climb rate is 1,940 feet per minute. So you might imagine if she made it to 800 feet, what, 30 seconds into the accident is when she started turning. It's a very fast aircraft, a lot to handle. Um, so now we t come to this question of risk management. Yes. So I have a question. Uh, is it normal for Concorde ATC to issue a instrument departure on a non IFR flight? Is it, what, what, isn't that odd for the controller to assign uh, a, an instrument departure on a non IFR flight? Um, they normally assign instrument departure on an IFR flight. Okay, this, this, was a, this was a non IFR because she canceled. They probably gave her a, a different, she canceled her own flight plan, but they probably gave her a different clearance. Clearance. Clarification. The clearance is a climb to BFR. That is a type of IFR clearance. Mm -hmm. It's not an IFR clearance to a final destination. Okay. It's a clearance to climb through and get above the clouds and then continue. BFR on your way. I see. So this can be issued without an IFR plan. This is an IFR clearance, but it's not a flight plan to it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So for people online, if you didn't hear, Taylor said to clear up the question of IFR, BFR on top, what does it mean? The clearance is an IFR departure to get out the clouds. And then once you're clear of the clouds, then you're flying BFR on top using BFR procedures um, using VFR altitudes, but you're still following any ATC clearance instructions later on. And that goes along with what Bob mentioned in the comments, that there is no issue with canceling IFR, but the new IFR clearance for a climb does require IFR proficiency and urgency. Okay, great. So let's talk about risk management. Um, we talked about this idea of the PAVE checklist or the five P's in term of pilot. This pilot is highly experienced, but right, she would draw from the safety bank account by not being proficient or current. Now the passenger, this is a not a not a pilot. Right? This is just a passenger, not necessarily a VFR instrument rated pilot. So if she wasn't current or proficient, one way she could have added to the safety deposit is bring an IFR rated proficient current person in the plane with her. Um, the airplane is a highly advanced aircraft. And sometimes we talk about this idea that it can, depending on who you are and what kind of flying skills you have. Some aircraft, the more advanced it is, it can be too much of an aircraft. And sometimes a simpler aircraft is easier to handle. In terms of the environment, at this time, the clouds were a pretty low ceiling and she was departing tailwind, which is unexpected. Um, normally at Monterey, most departures that I've experienced flying into Monterey is runway 28. And if you look at the departure procedures that have taken off from runway 28, it's a right turn. So it might be that she's used to flying in VFR condition, departing runway 28, turning right. And in this scenario, she's departing runway 10. She forgot or got flustered, really stressed out. She turned right like she normally would if she was taking off 2.8 and instead she's supposed to turn left. 
you know, there are a lot of speculations, things that we um, can think about, but what we want to extract is what can we learn from this, right? Um, then there's the external pressure that could have happened because she was on a mission to help her friend get to a location at a certain time. So now how do we think about risk management and what are some ways that you could reduce the risk? Anyone online? If you online, put in a chat box or in person, what are some ways she could have reduced the risk? Like we mentioned, bring an IFR rated proficient current pilot. What else? Yeah. Maybe not rented, you could have rented a different plane maybe uh, and not had such a difficult piece to fly. Yeah, it could have brought a simpler plane. Wait for VFR minimum. Wait for the VFR minimum when the clouds cleared. I think she should have just taken out a whole idea that she's taking her friend to do her favor. Yeah, a lot of it starts. Yeah, and just be careful anytime that you're doing a favor for someone or you're trying to meet someone at a certain time that adds to external pressure. And even though you know that like that's external pressure is really hard to override the type A pilot, you know, with a good heart. Building a buffer into a bigger schedule so you don't depart at a time where you cannot afford to wait for the weather to improve. Yeah, planning for alternate way of transportation. A couple of comments. Ben mentioned online. Be open to using the airline. It is available at long rates. <laughs> they operate airlines. <laughs> yeah. Out of Monterey. Great. So someone online says be open to use the airline because she was flying to Sacramento. So there are airlines that go from Monterey to Sacramento. Autopilot, also Autopilot could help as well. Other things is really carefully brief the departure procedure. Um, I've been guilty of this in the past, but ever since I experienced what happened with my students and I read this accident, I'm very neurotic now about breathing the departure procedure, knowing exactly what to do and have no question in my mind of what we're going to do. Yes. So I just noticed I was doing practicing and I was holding up the approach plate for the first, yeah, on the on the and um and I was like oh, I had to clip to actually clip it on my yoke mm -hmm. uh, because I get the head bounce when I if I look down and raise my eyes up and that seemed to be a, a huge factor when I came to see outside point. Yeah, absolutely. So another common in a classroom is ergonomics. Is where are you putting things like your plate? Um, I like to mount my mini iPad on the window that cues my sight line along the same line picture as the instrument, and that allows me to not have too much head up and down, avoiding potential chance of spatial disorientation. If you do ever enter a scenario where you are experiencing spatial disorientation, what we tell students is to look at the attitude indicator. That usually resolve a lot of vertigo that you might experience. Yeah. One, one, one of the comments from Bob that there's you know, thousands of hours doesn't mean much if it was many months ago or years ago. Um, it's mostly what has happened recently, the last three days, three months, what have you done more recently that uh, is more important than the cumulated time for your plan. Great, so just to capture that online, is the other comment is even though she had thousands of hours, it doesn't mean much unless it's very recent. What happened in the last week, months, how much experience that she has? What did the NTSB say what her experience in the in the make and model is for the very simple. I didn't find that data. That if, if she was flying something else like 421 is mm -hmm. what people say after after takeoff you could pretty much become a receptionist for the flying and if you don't work the automation just right it's it's really hard to hand fly it and take over. Yeah, I, I didn't get the data. So the question was, do we know how much experience she has in that particular airplane? I didn't retrieve that data, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But uh, most people say that that plane is kind of hard to handle as a beast. Sounds like a lot of this is acknowledging personal limitations. Yes. Recent efficiency and um, you know, how much you know about that particular airport and its procedures and how recently you've done it. Absolutely. So Michelle mentioned that a lot of this is 
come down to personal minimums. And that's exactly the topic we're talking about today. Right? I love that transition because you got to know what are your limitations. It's not just limitation to aircraft or the approach plates, but what are your personal limitations? And here's a reveal. This is what I talked about last week is you got to keep the first things first. And I call it the three keys. This is how I simplify really complex topic like IFR into the atomic level of this is the least amount of thing that you have to do to be safe. And the order matters. The first priority that you have is to make sure you are flying on course. So left or right, you have to be on course because if you're flying between the mountains, if you're flying too far left or too far right, you're hitting the mountains. So the first priority is get on course. The second priority is high or low. Make sure you're at high enough altitude to avoid any terrain or obstacle. And the third priority is fast or slow. What is your airspeed? You don't want to be too slow and stalling. You don't want to be too fast as you're coming into approach because you will fly past the runway. So I always ask my students as we're flying, what are your three keys right now? And if you don't know the three keys at this moment, at every moment of your flight, you have lost situational awareness. You've lost control of your aircraft. You have to always know whether you're flying a certain heading or a desired truck, so left or right, what altitude you're trying to meet and how fast you're trying to fly. If you don't have those three keys, you're not controlling the aircraft. The aircraft's controlling you. So when it comes to instrument approach, we think of this as the plan view is your left or right. What is your course? How do I avoid this mountains as rising toward me? Number two, the profile view is high or low. How high do I have to fly to never hit anything? And then this little bar at the bottom that tells you the distance from the runway, that tells you fast or slow. When you're far, go fast. The closer you get to your runway, slow down a little bit. <laughs> and as you're about to land, um, slow down to about approach speed, plus or minus, or plus 10 knots usually. So if you're in a Cessna 172, for example, you might fly 105, if you're in an RG, 130 knots in the en route. And then as you're flying into this approach, you might fly 90 knot ground speed. And then when you're about two or three miles, slow down to about 80 knots. And then when you see the runway, slow down to 70 knots, add your flaps and land at approach speed of 65. So any questions so far? Good. I have a question. When you when you do your planning, I assume you use uh, electronic, uh, like some, some sort of an app. Do you also prepare a traditional flight log with uh, wind uh, correction and all that? Because that is a, a, an issue I run into. The, the tablet-based apps generally do not really give enough information to prepare a backup plan, plan that's, that has the magnetic courses and the, and the corrections. And that is a lot of reverse engineering to do the backup. In general, um, most people just fly with four flight, for example, and using their GPS or their viewer, iOS localizer. Um, I don't know of many people who, well, when I was flying corporate, we would have a printout of our nav log and we might tr track to see what's our fuel burn at this location. Yeah, but in general, most of us use electronic flight bag. Are mostly using, I mean, you have to, well, if you're doing our nav, you pretty much have to have an onboard GPS. So you're using that for your basic navigation and for like for briefing the flight, uh, your, your approach and, and that, but you're not really using that directly for the navigation. You're using that to keep track of where you are along the way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can also sense? get backup. Um, backup units, I mean, if you would, like I typically, when I'm doing my bar, typically fly with actually two tablets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I recommend, well, I fly with a mini iPad and a phone that has yeah. four flights. 
And then I would always, if I'm flying into actual RMC with an instrument rated provision current pilot, who we'll also have a mini iPad and a phone. So now we have four devices in the airplane and we also have the GPS and the ground-based VOR localizer navates. Uh, receptor, receiver that we can use as well. Then we have ATC, so we have a lot of redundancy. And then a, another redundancy you can have is a paper terminal procedure chart. Okay. Hard copies. Go be a far Yeah, so <laughs> we'll talk about that. All right, so moving on to um, planning and approach from Reed Hill View to Monterey. The first question, if you're applying, taking off from Reed Hill View, landing in Monterey, you might ask which route. So if you do it in for a flight, you put in flight plan, you click on route, it gives you some route advisor. In general, if you're departing from Reed Hill View, the procedure is something like fly towards San Jose and Salinas and Monterey. Now here's the general route of what that might looks like. I'll show you an example clearance that I got recently. So we are picking up all of our clearance we do it with ground at Reed Hill View. The pilot might say Reed Hill View ground, Skyhawk 54102 at Air Dynamic, picking up IFR into Monterey with information echo, whatever that ADIS is. And note that all IFR departures taking it out from Reed Hill View always depart from runway 31. It will not depart from 13 anytime soon, that I know of. Um, and here's the clearance. The clearance would be clear to Monterey Airport via on departure turn left heading 2900, radar vector San Jose Salinas direct. Climb maintain 4000, expect 7000, five minutes, departure frequency 121.3, swap 4520. So here's my shortcut. I always make sure I know how to shortcut um, the clearance. Otherwise, if you try to write this all out, you're going to be way behind. So shortcut, Kilo, Mike, Romeo, Yankee, L for left, 290, SJC, SNS, three letters is the VOR. Altitude, I don't write the 3000. I just write 4, 7, subscript 5 for the minutes, frequency, and the transponder. So one quick question from Bob online was, which route do you recommend? Uh, but yeah, that's slide right there, 25. Which route do you recommend? Awesome. So the question online is, which route do I recommend? I love this route. The reason is because when I'm departing on Reed Hill View, the route puts me towards San Jose. If there's any problem that I'm experiencing with my aircraft, I'm already beeline to my best ultimate airport. Giant airport, lots of services, fire trucks, ambulance right there, long runway. I love going towards San Jose. And then from San Jose going toward um, Salinas, that gives me ground navigates and I can use GPS as well. So that's the layer of redundancy. And then Salinas would be my alternate if I was flying toward Monterey or maybe um, if I noticed, you know, as I'm listening to the ADAS and the, the METAR reading it and the clouds are closing in, I might stop by San Martin, Hollister on the way down. Question. Have you ever gotten a clearance out of here that didn't take you direct to San Jose? I, I never have. I've never gotten a clearance out of Reed Hill View that doesn't take me towards San Jose. The clearance usually says left 290 towards San Jose. That's, yep. And I was just going to say real quick on the routing to on for flight, it'll also tell you like the number of times that's been assigned. Yes. So you can look at it and go, oh, 156 times. Probably going to get that routing. Absolutely. So, as opposed to one that says like two or three or five times. Is, is the reason so that uh, all the all the IFR traffic is taken out of the uh, inbound corridor for the jets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also terrain, keep you oh, clear of terrain. terrain on the way out. Right. Yeah. So the uh, the common is that uh, when we're departing our Reed Hill view and they vector you towards San Jose, it's keeping you out the rising mountains on the right side as you're departing runway three one, and Anytime you're flying over the airport, that's actually the lowest part of any approaches in for inbound airliners. So that keeps you at the lowest part, allowing other aircrafts to come in. Yes. Is there a tech route? There should be. Let me know. 
<laughs> get up from me now and you can see the tech route over there. And the comment earlier, just for the recording, is uh, you can look at the four flights and see how many times the route has been cleared. So 156 is a really good indication that they'll probably give you that clearance too. All right, so now we're looking at which approach. The approach is usually requested by the pilot. But you can have really good indication because the tower will broadcast the preferred runway or the preferred approach on ATIS, but you get to make the request. So, for example, if you want an approach on the opposite runway, then tower might rupture you around, make you circle a bit to allow everyone to enter. Maybe sometimes they'll deny you. Um, but usually the pilot can request any approach he wants and then it you know, up to, to NorCal and Power to work that out. I'm guessing that also, uh, since this can be up to an hour out of date, that you might get some FAR that builds up and it completely changes things. Exactly. Yeah, the one thing that Michelle is noting is that Monterey is a very dynamic environment. Fogs go in and out. Um, so the, if you hear something on a meter on an ATIS, if you hear something on the ATIS, it might change by the time you arrive. But generally, an ATIS is a good way to get an idea. Um, you're also looking at visibility and ceiling that's required for each approach, the altitude minimums, any climb performance, and terrain, mountains versus water. So we're going to look at it in detail. The AFD for Monterey in particular says avoid flying runway 28 left or in Yankee when possible to reduce noise impacts. Doesn't mean that you can't fly it. It just means that that's noise abatement, which is a recommendation, suggestions. But if on that day the weather favors that particular approach, you can make a request. And usually ATC is very accommodating. Well, there's ATC recent higher ups of inbound airplanes. Anybody's flown there recently in the last you know, recent approaches. You could ask ATC and you recent fire ups from it. Awesome. For the recording, so Taylor mentioned that you can also ask ATC what are the most recent PI reps, other pilots who have landed Monterey, what approaches did they use? What are the ceiling, the base and top of the cloud? So you can expect how long are you going to be in what we call the soup, which is solid IMC. Does approach normally have uh, access to those PI reps or would the Yes. Um, so NorCal is constantly listening to pilots and, you know, pilots were constantly reporting. For example, if I'm flying through a cloud and I know the base and top of a cloud, I would let NorCal know. And then later on, when an aircraft is flying that route, I hear NorCal relate information I just told them to this new aircraft and it helps them make decisions. Uh, at the flight level, you hear this very often. So, for example, when I was flying at flight level 450, I would hear United says, hey, at flight level 370 is really turbulent, choppy. Uh, American airline pilot would ch chime in and says, well, you know, when I'm at flight level 350 is much calmer here. So then the United pilot would ask, oh, okay, can I get down to 350 for my passenger comfort? So we hear pilots uh, reporting PI reps and exchanging information constantly, and that helps them make really good decisions. So here's a sample um, ATIS that I just got this morning from Monterey. So Monterey Tower Information X-ray 1903 Zulu, wind 090 at 6, visibility 10, sky clear, temperature 15, dew point 0, altimeter 3033, visual approach runway 10, right and use, landing and departing runway 10, right and left, pay attention, runway center line separated, ensure you have the correct runway and verify it on initial contact. You have information x-ray. So a lot of time I fly with instrument pilots and they only write a few things on from the ATIS. And here is what I think at minimum you should write down because it will change the decisions that you make. For example, the wind direction, that could change whether you can actually land at all. Does the crosswind component um, acceptable for your skill level or for the airplane capability. Uh, the wind direction also determines which approach you're going to fly. The visibility in the ceiling determines which approach you're going to fly. <laughs> the temperature and dew point helps you know, is it going to fog up and be more cloudy, more rain? 
And then the runway helps you know which approach you should anticipate. You could ask for an approach on the opposite runway for whatever reasons and you'd circle to land on runway one zero. Just know that that might need some uh, working around with eight NorCal and tower because everyone is departing runway one zero. But at minimum, I teach my students to record these information. When visibility, ceiling, temperature and dew point if it's a very closed day, altimeter, and then which runway. So let's take a look at the approaches that are available. There's the iOS runway 10 and the RNAP 10 if you are planning to land on runway 10. How do you make the decision of which approach to use? It depends on what kind of equipment you have. But if you have equipment for both the iOS and the RNAP, then I look at the minimums. So if you look at the iOS procedure, the minimums is 398 feet versus the RNAV is 718 feet. So if you use the iOS, you can get down much lower. And that's preferable. You want more guidance for a longer amount of time or lower and lower. Um, that helps you out a lot. And for both approaches, there's the circling minimums as well. Now let's take a look. This is the favorite uh, question on an instrument check ride if you haven't gotten your instrument yet, is what is the pound sign on the SIOS 10 right? This is a pound. And then there's SIOS 10 right, no pound. And the pound sign is referring to the missed approach, OK? Because there's two iOS 10 right. So how do I know which minimums I should descend to? Is it 398 or 583? Well, if you look at the misapproach procedures, it says misapproach, if you're using the iOS with the pound sign, requires a minimum climb of 265 feet per nautical mile. So beforehand, before you even come in and try to land, you need to figure out what's your climb performance. So here's a sample Cessna 172 climb performance. If I'm climbing at 76 knot VY, and I usually climb until I'm clear of obstacle 1,000 AGL, then my climb rate might be 394 feet per nautical mile. But after I'm clear of obstacle or usually 1,000 AGL, then I might pitch down a little bit lower, 90 knot cruise climb speed, about 333 feet per nautical miles. So I can estimate my Cessna 172 and probably climb between 333 feet and 390 four feet per nautical miles, that's the range. But I'm gonna estimate a little bit lower because you know, my plane is not the newest plane, it might not be the best engine, et cetera. But looking at this, the minimum is 265 feet, so I could probably meet that, right? If I underestimate my climb performance to 300 feet per nautical mile, I'm still well clear if it's 265 feet per nautical mile. So that means that I could fly this iOS all the way to 398 feet minimum if I wanted to. Uh, one thing to note is if you're flying the 1-0 approach, this takes you over the ocean, which there are two advantages. Well, there's an advantage and disadvantage. This advantage is you're over the ocean. But the advantage to that is you're over the ocean. You're not in the mountainous region. So over the ocean, you know that it's pretty flat. There's less thing for you to hit. So if you are not perfect on your glide slope, it can be a little bit more forgiving. Flying over the ocean and approach coming into land, just know that if you have an engine problem, well, now you got to glide into the land. But if you are taking a look at the 2-8 approaches, you're flying over mountains. Over mounts, well, if your engine have a problem, you might have an easier time gliding to best place to land, maybe. Uh, but you are over mounts, so you better be perfect on that fly slope. Never be low is what I tell my students. Um, and if you train with me and you fly a few flights until you're relatively Proficient, I tell my students, anytime you go below minimums, you owe me a bubble tea, <laughs> litchi <laughs> flavor, okay? Because there has to be some consequence for flying below altitude. And in training, 
The consequence is a seven bucks, five bucks bubble tea for me. But, uh, you know, in an actual IFR flight plan, it could be a pilot deviation or an incident or an accident. So the more that my students train with me and the more proficient they should get, the consequent right, increase. But always never fly below minimums. I teach all my students if there's a minimums at 50 feet. If you're more than 100 feet, that could be a pilot deviation, but 50 feet, that keeps you safe. Um, below minimums is no go. And on an instrument check ride, one foot below minimum is this instant fail. There's no question asked. That's the one thing that the DP on an IFR check ride will never forgive because the terrain does not forgive that. All right, so looking at the localizer 28 right, you can see that the localizer brings you down to a minimum an MDA at 1,860 feet. But the RNAV Yankee actually brings you down to 1,080 feet. So the RNAV Yankee is actually a little bit lower. Note that the airport um, remarks says, uh, you know, avoid flying this for noise abatement procedures. But if it's actual IFR and you want to fly this approach because is much safer, it brings you down lower. And you can notice the route actually avoids terrain for a little bit longer than the localizer, then you could ask for this approach and they would likely clear you for it. Uh, any questions so far about how to determine which approach to fly? Yeah. So on the uh, RNAV Yankee, it says there, for the it has a slash 55. What's the slash? What, how do you read that there? The, the, in the uh, notes? Yeah, yeah, or just like on the uh, profile view there. Yeah, the minimums there for the localizer performance MBA there. And you know, with the, uh, uh, the slash 55 <laughs> means that. Where does it say that? That's, that's visibility. That's it. Oh, is it, oh, 5,500, or but if you look category A there. On a, okay, oh, so localizer 2.8. Yeah, 2.8. Category yeah, A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then category A, it says uh, localizer performance of BA, and then category A, and, and it looks like minimum there is uh, 1,080, correct? And then slash <laughs> 55 there. Do you see that, Taylor? Oh, they are not. Yeah. Yeah. It's only oh, okay. <laughs> You're talking okay. about the RNAV. Got it on the screen there. Okay. Right, right, so, there. Um, <laughs> the question is the RNAV, Yankee 28 left. Why does the altitude on the LP, it says 1080 slash 55. The 55 is the RVR, runway visual range. Oh, Just okay. that means that you need to have this amount of visibility and then um, certain ceiling before you can fly this approach. So usually when you're flying into an airport where the visibility is really low, they stop reporting it into three statute mile visibility. They report it into feet, runway visual range. You will usually hear that in ATIS, and that means that it's very, very low visibility. You should only see like 5,500 feet down the runway. Uh, to, to read the plane slash means RVR in hundreds of feet, dash means visibility in statue miles. Correct, yes. And we will see that here. Okay, so I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, a lot of people are confused with this concept of category A, B, C, D, which category am I? And here is the FA definition. The category is determined if you're flying a jet by your V ref, or if you're not flying a jet or something that has V ref, is 1.3 VSO. This is where it gets interesting is if some of you might fly fast airplane. For example, when I flew an airplane coming in, if we're flying a straight in, we're in category B, but if we're doing a circling minimum, we have to fly a little bit faster so we don't get into the accelerated stall when we're doing a circle to land, then we happen to be in category C. So it depends on what your aircraft approach speed coming in is to know what category you're in. And that a lot of time determines what altitude you can fly below. 
But here is the question. Yes, Taylor? Yeah, one question from Bubbles. Why is the RMAP 10 right for the LPV? Why is the minimum lower than the ILS, even though the MIST approach is very similar? Why is the RNAV 10 right? Yeah, the LPV, uh -huh. the GPS based minimums, yeah. are not as low. The ILS gets you lower than mm -hmm. the GPS. I can input a lot of that. I can give my input. Uh, GPS is coming around to approaches, but it's not as accurate as an ILS, uh, even to this day. Uh, it's getting very close. And some of that is they're just designed uh, differently. You'll hear the term perps, which is how they design approach procedures, um, keeping you clear. So the GPS, while very accurate today, um, doesn't meet those conditions uh, to get you as low. For most airplanes. Great. So, for the recording, uh, Taylor mentioned that there's a question why is the RNAV approach doesn't get as low as the IOS approach? And it's because the FAA has what's called TERPs. When they're designing these instrument approach, there's certain criteria that they have to meet, like the approach has to have this number of altitude above terrain, this lateral distance, altitude distance. And the iOS is designed before the GPS, so it's designed and considered the precision approach. The GPS is the newer um, technology, so sometimes the approaches are not designed to go as low. And the GPS approach is still considered non-precision because they don't always meet the TERPs requirement, but the FAA do publish them uh, to help pilot uh, be able to get in and out of approaches easily because it's much easier to create a GPS approach than an iOS approach. To have an iOS approach, you need equipment that costs millions of dollars and lots of maintenance, but a GPS approach is something that's a lot easier to create. And you need with, with LTV approaches? Are they better than the Practically so, speaking, ILS is based, is equipment based at the airport for that approach. LPV is based on GPS, which is hundreds of miles away. So there is a level of unknown and uncertainty, okay. uh, even though it is very accurate and we trust it a lot today. Uh, it's you know up here a couple hundred miles away versus the equipment that is on the ground for that airport specifically. So what Taylor is mentioning is the iOS is based on a ground-based equipment at the airports on the ground versus the GPS is based on satellites that are hundreds of thousands of miles in the sky. So iOS is considered much more precise. And in fact, if you fly commercial operation, usually if an approach have an iOS approach, that's the, the default is everyone will fly the iOS approach. And then if not able or don't want to for some reason, then they would fly the GPS approach. Um, okay, so here's the question of what are the annotations mean, and um, you can find this. This is just a cutout of a <coughs> legend that's in your terminal procedure publication, and it explains to you exactly how the approach plate is written and what it means. So when it's slash, it says visibility RVR of hundreds of feet. I've taken off in the airport when I was doing a commercial operation uh, when I can't even see the full runway. All I can see is the numbers. I'm lining up at the beginning of the runway and all I can see is the numbers. So that's when we use RVR is how much of the runway could I see in feet? But if it's much wider than that, then they start reporting in visibility in units of statue mile visibility. So here, visibility in statue mile. The other number that I think is quite important and a lot of people miss is what is called the HAT. So the HAT is height above touchdown point. That's the height of the decision height or minimum distance in altitude above the highest runway elevation at the touchdown zone. That means that if you're flying the instrument approach and you are at the DA or the MDA, you're gonna be this distant, this height, above the runway. 
So this is how I determine my personal minimums when it comes to flying. For me, I want the visibility to be at least higher than three stash mile visibility because I've seen what it looks like when it's one and it's not fun at all. And I want the ceiling to be whatever this height, H-A-T, height above touchdown, plus 500 feet. That means that I'll pop out of clouds, I'll have 500 feet in visual condition before I reach the minimums, my DA or NDA. And for me, that feels really good. And then uh, I have an extra distance from that height to make the landing. So in this case, if I'm doing the iOS 10 right pound, um, the height above touchdown is 200. So I would want a ceiling of at least nine, 700 feet and then I would have distance yeah do you adjust that depending upon how fast the airplane you're flying is um, so because if you're in a faster airplane you're going to have a lot like you're going to be sending faster to maintain that glide slope mm -hmm. um, so you're going to have less time to make a decision yes so the question is you adjust your personal minimums depending on the aircraft absolutely if you're flying a faster aircraft you might have more advanced technology as well. So you might have the autopilot that helps you. Our autopilot, when I was flying a jet, it captures the glide slope all the way to minimums. And so I'm just letting the autopilot fly and just monitoring that until it hits minimum. And then I disconnect the autopilot and I put it down at the last 200 feet or so. But if I'm flying a GA aircraft, with not a lot of advanced equipment and I'm hand flying it, I might want to raise my personal minimum higher. Yeah. So you're saying just because it says you can go down a 398 there, you're like, hey, let's give myself a little bit of comfort level here just so I'm not right on the edge there. Absolutely. So the comment in the classroom is just because the minimum says 398 feet, don't fly and expect the ceiling to be right there in the minimums because one, any weather forecast is constantly changing. Uh, two, the transition from solid IMC into visual can be really disorienting just as going from visual into solid IMC. So you pop out of the cloud and there's a moment of like, ah, oh, where's the runway? What is happening? How fast I'm going? A lot of instrument pilot rated or non-rated pilots, the moment they remove the fog or pop out the clouds, they start doing a little weird stuff. <laughs> so like, give yourself some altitude for you to start doing weird stuff. Weird stuff that they're doing, start banking, changing, changing the pitch, killing the power, adding flaps. A lot of weird stuff happen when people transition from solid IMC or foggles into VFR. Give yourself some altitude to adjust. You're a human. You're not designed to be a robot and you can't be that perfect. Um, so have a personal minimums. Mine will probably be different than yours, depending on your personal experience. Um, we'll talk another personal minimums, how much fuel. So the FAA regulations, this is the favorite DP question. The fuel requirement for flight in IFR, you gotta complete a flight to the first airport intended landing, fly to the next, alternate airport and fly after that 45 minutes. But this is what Jen and I teach, Jen is our chief instructor, is you gotta plan to fly the, the departure and the approach, which is not necessarily a direct route from A to B. Um, and then you gotta plan for the miss. What if you have to go miss, right? So you're gonna fly the miss approach. The miss doesn't put you directly to the alternate either. So you gotta plan to fly the miss, do the hold maybe three times to get your head together, resituated, set things in your GPS, get ATC clearance, fly to the alternate and plan to fly the alternate approach plus 45 minutes fuel reserve. So a lot more fuel than what the FAA recommends is what we teach. All right, so that is halfway through your first code phrase is IFR personal minimums. This is one thing you get out today is always make sure you have some personal minimums. If you are not sure, because it's been a long time, you're not very current or proficient, 
have a conversation with CFII and or go up and apply with CFII to establish your personal minimums. A pause at this time. Any questions? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, yeah. when you're talking about minimums, like flying an ILS and it's in high winds. You, your nose might not be oriented with the runway. You pop out of the clouds and you're looking this way and the runway is whatever direction you're cramping in. Pop in the middle of Absolutely. I love that comment. So the comment in the classroom is sometimes when you're flying the iOS, you could be perfect. But if it's turbulence or cloudy, um, especially if you're flying into a cloud, it's usually turbulence. So you're combining that together, you pop out and you might not even be pointed at the runway, right? You might be offset, a little high, a little low. So give yourself some tolerance, some altitude to fix it, <laughs> get back on center line. Right, and set your speed to be perfect, set your configuration. A lot of time when people pop out the clouds, they add flaps and they're not careful to push the yoke down because anytime you add flaps, the nose pitch up. So they go back into the clouds again. So make sure if you're gonna add flap, push, trim, 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 push the pitch down. Make sure you maintain a constant descent, glide path um, because you don't want to be adding flaps, changing configurations, and then ballooning and getting too high or too low. Right? After you descend below minimums, the expectation is that you're flying a constant descent path, normal approach to landing. Uh, I noticed a lot of uh, tailwheel pilots uh, who are used to flying in VFR condition and then they'll drop the power and just dive coming into the landing, do the uh, the port slip, right? Because tailwheel pilots usually don't have flaps, and and then they go to instrument flying, <laughs> and then they fly this beautiful, perfect approach. We pop out the foggles of the cloud, and they're doing this crazy thing: chop the power, port slip, vertical dive, and I'm like, no, that's not what the approach is designed for. The approach is designed or a normal, stable glide path coming in. Okay. Any comments? Uh, just one question. Of what do you recommend when ATCS says expect indefinite delay, since there is no definition of <laughs> indefinite delay? I'll add a little bit there. I think it goes back to your fuel planning. Yes. Know what you can personally accept for a delay. Because um, you're supposed to get issues like an expect further clearance. You may get the random expect further delay, which are, are indefinite. It's just because ATC is really trying to figure out how am I going to coordinate everybody coming in and out. Um, but set your own personal minimum. Of, I can only accept this amount of delay before I have to make a decision to go somewhere else. For. So the question is, what would you do if um, ATC said expect indefinite delay? And it goes into field planning. I'm going to tell you a story. The story is great for learning purposes. Taylor and I were flying with our instrument student to Santa Ana, John Wing. And there are two runways there. We're flying this instrument approach. We're popping through the clouds. It's actual. And as we're coming in, we're getting nice and set up, and we're excited. Right? It's been a long way. We were coming from Santa Barbara, Paso, and Reed Hillview previously. It's been a long flight. And as we're coming in, there is an aircraft that had an accident on the runway. So suddenly they closed the runway that we were cleared to land on and they vectored everyone out. Right? They're sending United American Airlines, they start vectoring us away from the approach because they're not sure what to do. Now I'm looking at my view and I go, I don't know how long I can you know, fly because it's been a long time since we have fueled up and I don't feel comfortable just holding indefinite. So I started immediately looking for my alternate. What's the closest airport? What's the weather condition? How do we get there? And then what I realized was the runway that was closed because the aircraft had an accident there is the long runway. And they actually have two runways. And the other short runway is definitely within my personal minimum for landing the plane. So I tell ATC, hey, could I, I get back on the approach, but a size step and land on the shorter runway? So they allowed us to come back in the approach and land on a shorter runway while United American Airlines is hanging out, getting ready to land at 
they are ultimate. But it takes a constant vigilance, having that situational awareness and anticipating what's happening, helping ATC out. So don't just be sitting duck going, well, I'm just gonna wait to see what ATC tells me to do. You gotta think about how much fuel do I have? Uh, how much uh, brain capacity do I have? We've been plan we've been flying for a long time. Like, you know, my brain capacity is reaching my limit. I can't fly that long anymore. I wanna come in and land. How do I help ATC out? By giving them a suggestion that will allow them to say yes to me. Yeah. Just, just the comment based on watching like a lot of uh, emergency handling evacuation channel on YouTube, especially. Uh, it seems amongst the airlines, it's a standard procedure. Whenever they're given a fault for emergency or some other unusual situation, they will immediately say, we can accept 15 minutes. Mm. Great. So the comment um, Mackie is making in the classroom is usually when he hears radio calls online, when an airliner is being given a hold, they would respond to ACC that they can hold for this amount of time. And in a, in a similar way, you might say that to approach as well, like I can hold it for, you know, five, 20 minutes, but uh, then I need to go in for an approach. And I would like to go to this airport, right? Help ATC out. Yeah, so maybe we can talk about this offline. I don't understand the whole concept of the hat. Why is that the same as the first number? Why is the hat 200 less than the 398? Isn't that where that drops you down? Okay, so, so the hat is the lowest altitude. When you hit your, D, your DA, for example, 398 feet, that means at that moment you're 200 feet from the runway. You don't want your clouds to be there, right? You want your clouds, at least for me, right, this is my personal minimums, I want the clouds to be higher than the lowest altitude that my instrument approach would guide me to, so that I pop out a cloud way in advance before I reach my minimums, and then I have time to maneuver my aircraft in case I didn't do such a good job holding left or right or high or low. So I want to give myself an extra buffer with that. And just just in, in case that was your question, the 398, that's MSL, and 200, that's an actual, that's height above, well, touchdown zone, which is the, the elevation figure, is it's Google be given on the plane. So if you have the elevation figure and the second figure here, you will get the first uh, 398. So so from, from this, you can, you can tell that it's, 198 is the elevation figure for the airport on the flight. Oh. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so the clarification is the 398, that's your DA. That's written in MSL. That's what you will see in the altimeter. The 200 is written in AGL. And so the airport elevation is 198 feet. You have 200 feet before you reach the runway. But your clouds, your ceilings is written in AGL. <laughs> so when you're looking at the clouds, don't look at the MSL number. You got to look at the AGL number, right? Because the clouds are in AGL. How high above the ground? Does that make sense? Yes. So, and there's also the factor your altimeter should be what plus or minus 75 feet. Right? Mm -hmm. So we could have a deviation of 75 feet plus or minus there, correct? Absolutely. The other thing is when we're doing instrument check, we're making sure that our altimeter is within plus or minus 75 feet. So depending on your altimeter setting and how you're, in case you forgot your altimeter too, some of us do, right? I teach my students that anytime you come in to approach, neurotically checked that your altimeter is correct otherwise the whole approach is busted um but it also depends on how well your altimeter works so you want that buffer you don't want to be popping out the cloud at your minimums super dangerous and not have a lot of time to maneuver around uh, now just another yeah from Canada, but in Canada we have cold weather correction. Many times the temperature is below zero degrees Celsius, you gotta compensate for your for all these numbers. Yes. And I don't know if that uh, applies over here. Absolutely. Yeah. So Canadian pilot in the room says in Canada they have 
cold weather uh, correction, we do too in the US. One time I was flying into Boise, Idaho, super cold, hailing, low visibility, one statue miles. I don't know why we're flying there, but that's corporate jet. <laughs> and we had cold temperature correction and it correction corrected a thousand feet, a thousand feet. So if you didn't pay attention to the cold temperature correction, you would be off by a thousand feet in the mountains in Boise, Idaho, in the hail with one statue mile visibility. I don't know if any places in California, maybe Big Bear or something might have it, but certainly in Colorado and mm -hmm. uh, Utah and I guess. Boise yeah. Canada. Yep. So in a mountainous area, you will have that cold temperature correction. Um, all right. So let's talk about briefly and I have our approach plate. This is a review from last week, but I teach my students on the ground to plan my avionics setup because I don't want to be fumbling in the air in the soup, which is actually why I'm seeing the clouds, and trying to figure out where do I put my frequency? Is this correct? Did I tune in the right number? So here's my strategy. Up to you, whatever you like. We have usually two COM radios and then two NAV radios. In COM1, I would usually put what I talk in, so NorCal, and then next one is Monterey Tower. I know that the last NorCal frequency would be posted on the plate. So for example, in this case, if I see NorCal tell me tune in 133 or 127.15, I know that that's the last NorCal and I can immediately put in my standby Monterey Tower, 118.4. And then in my listen, I would put in Monterey ATIS and my alternate. So maybe that's Salinas ATIS. I keep my Monterey ATIS there because I like to neurotically check the ATIS and see if the altimeter setting has changed at all during my approach. If it has been a while in the approach, I want to check, make sure my altitude is correct. In my nav system, I would have my destination. So for example, if I'm flying the localizer iOS, I would have the localizer uh, tune in. In this case, 110.7. And in my standby, I would have the MIPS. In this case, it'll be the VOR, Salinas. And then for redundancy in my NAV2, I put the exact same thing. The reason is because I've flown an approach where halfway through the approach, my NAV1 fails. <laughs> okay. The Nino got stuck. I don't know what's happening. I'm tapping on a Nino. Hello, you working? Didn't work. So we use NAV2. I now have that redundancy because of that moment. I also teach my student to write down beforehand your radio communication script. If it has been a long time, I prepare it because I've flown with instrument rated pilots who have flown for a long time, lots of hours, fumble on the radio. What's the problem with that? The problem is in the moment that you have incredibly high workload, when you fumble on the radio, there's a moment of embarrassment and you're like trying to correct it. And in that moment, you stop flying the airplane. You forget the three keys. And that is the most dangerous moment. I've flown with many pilots, IFR and non-IFR rated pilots. When they're making their radio calls, they stop flying the plane, right? They start veering left or right, stop descending, start climbing again on an approach just because they're trying to perfect this radio call. And that is, unnecessary risk. So I teach my students, go home, write it down. And this is a new approach, write down exactly what you're gonna say. That way you're not fumbling over it. That way your brain space has significantly increased and allows you to focus on your three keys, which is left or right, high or low, fast or slow. That's the most important thing that you do on an approach, okay? So I would anticipate something like, if I find an iOS localizer one zero right, Somewhere when I'm getting on the approach, NorCal might say, fly a certain heading, maintain a certain altitude, clear for the iOS, one zero right to Monterey. Or they might say, clear for the iOS, one zero right, Monterey, except maintain a certain altitude. So I know that that's usually the two things they'll say. I'm preparing in advance. That way when they say it, I'm not surprised. Then they'll say something, Along the way, maybe closer to my final approach fix, contact tower. I'll say contact tower. 
Then when I contact Tower, I'll say, all right, Tower, 54102 on iOS 10, right? This is a moment where your type A um, pilot will love to add in more stuff and give a lot of details. The problem with that is you're in the most critical phase of the approach. Usually past the final approach fix coming in, incredibly high workload, really low to and close to terrain. You don't want your brain capacity to be thinking about those long, beautiful radio calls. You want to keep it short. That way your brain capacity is focused on flying the plane. So just on iOS 1.0, right? Tower knows that you're coming in. They've seen you miles and miles away. Even if you forget to make that radio call, they saw you coming in. So this is not the critical radio call. <laughs> the critical radio call is you're listening for your clearance. Um, but after that, tower sees you. So fly the plane first. If you have brain capacity, you have time, which hopefully you have prepared well advanced and you do, and you're gonna tell tower and say you're on iOS 1.0, right? That's it, keep it clean. And then you're listening for clear lamp. Um, unlike at the non-towered airport where you have to close your own IFR flight plan because there's one in, one out, only other aircraft, other aircraft can only come in after you close the flight plan. When you're landing at a towered airport, it automatically gets closed for you. Questions on radio? Yes. I, I thought I once heard that uh using four or sometimes two and two can be confused for the number four and the two. And I often view out, I'll say clear at ILS one zero run out to RA. So absolutely the um, the comment is the word four and two is often confused by the number four and the number two. And I teach my student that for a non cloud airport. I don't say I'm turning base four, runway four. <laughs> That's very confusing. I don't know what you're doing. Um, but when you are flying IFR, it's less of a risk because you're talking to ATC. They have cleared you for this approach. It's kind of standard phraseology, and these are They've seen you hundreds, you know, miles and miles away. Just kind of expected. But if you cut down that word, that's perfectly fine. You can chop your preposition and say clear iOS 1.0, right? Absolutely. Or yeah. But usually the phrase like clear to land has the word to in it. Um, and when you're talking with ATC, there's less chance of confusion because they're telling you what to do. It's a game of Simon says. <laughs> anyway, so you're just doing whatever they say, and you're just copycat and repeating what they tell you. Um, so there's less of a risk of confusion because Simon says, yeah. The particularly bad thing, it's, it's less of a, of a concern here, but more on like the torture, is a lot of people use over instead of climbing. So then they'll say mm. 54102, 4,000, 4, 7,000. And that's really confusing because they mean 4,000 to climb at 7,000. Yes, I love that comment. Thank you for bringing that, Mechie. Uh, my pet peeve is when people are flying departure and they first contact NorCal, they would say something like, for example, they're 2,000 climbing 7,000. They're supposed to say 2,000 climbing 7,000, but they'll say climbing through, climbing through 2,000, climbing 7,000. And that climbing through 2000 sound a lot like two 2000. <laughs> so I teach my students add 2000 climbing 7000. Try to reduce the preposition that sound like the number as much as possible. And that's why nine is, uh, we call it niner, right? Because in German language, nine is no. <laughs> so. That's my other pet peeve. You say the number nine and you just say nine. No, it's actually niner is the number, or five is five, or three is actually tree. So if you are practicing proper pronunciation, there's a particular way to say tree, five, niner, et cetera. Great. Thank you for that comment. Uh, always, when you're flying, stay ahead of the aircraft. So expect traffic advisory. So here's the image 
of um, how I might set my aircraft cockpit settings to avoid that going up and down, looking up and down, spatial disorientation, with the exception that I would use a mini iPad because a normal iPad is really, really big. But this allows me to keep my sight line just horizontal. I can keep my head the same and just move my eyeballs, which is a lot easier than looking up and down. A lot of people have yoke mounts or a kneeboard mounts that can cause spatial disorientation. Um, I'm also expecting traffic advisory and radar vector. So let me tell you about the approach into Monterey. There was one time we're flying and there's a jet coming behind us. So NorCal tells us to do a 360. And I'm flying the iOS 28 right. I'm flying 28 right. What I beat myself up over at night afterward is I didn't brief that the mountains is my left side. Because if I had briefed that, I would know that I'm going, if I'm asked to do a 360 on a Monterey approach, I should do a right 360. Okay. But on that day, I did a left 360 because I can see the jet coming on my ADSB. He's coming on my right side. So I thought, okay, I would do a left 360 to avoid a jet that's coming on my right side. But I should have been more cautious and think about where's the terrain on that approach. Mountains on my left, flat land on my right side. I might just cautiously do a right 360 or confirm with ATC, can I do a right 360? Would um, ATC normally assign the direction that they want to do 360 in? Sometimes, sometimes they might not. And even if they do assign, you might request, right? You might say, hey, I know that it's terrain on my left. Is it okay if I turn to the right? Because I'm worried about the terrain. Luckily on that day, we're pretty high and there was the moon so we can see the mountains and I knew that we're okay, but that's something I beat myself up at night is just how it remembers, where's the mountains, <laughs> okay? The first priority, left or right. Um, use an IMR approach checklist. I used to have really long approach checklist. Then I realized I can't remember it anyway. So now I dial it down to ABC. This is how I simplify it. The A, as I always listen to ages, A was to see if I can find the approach and remember to set the altimeter. Otherwise, my whole approach is busted. Then the B, as I'm building the approach in my GPS and briefing the plate, and the C is checklist. So I do my A, B, C. And that usually covers the mandatory steps. Um, I tell my students, if you're not doing anything, you're behind. <laughs> okay. So you should always be doing something and something might not be like touching stuff. Something could just be monitoring. Now I teach my students to scan instruments and you wanna think of scanning in a musical instrument, a musical rhythm. I do an account of eight, if any of you are musicians, one and two and three and four. So I'm looking at attitude, airspeed, altimeter, VSI, and I'm just going thoroughly, methodically across my piano, checking for flight, um, GPS. I've had students flying the instrument approach. And as we get closer and closer to final, students get nervous, start putting us in a steep turn. Took over, land the aircraft. I go, what happened there? Students said, I didn't realize we're in a turn. Now I tell the student there are at least eight things in your views that are telling you you're in a turn. One, your four, four flights telling you you're in turn. Heading indicators telling you you're in turn. Attitude indicator, turn coordinator, compass, GPS, <laughs> localizer. Your needle is telling you you're in a turn. What do you mean you don't know that you were in a turn, right? So if you keep up your scan, methodically don't fixate on anything, just keep scanning, <clears throat> then it will save you from that. A story that Jen tells me, she's training a CFII in the simulator. And she gave the CFII just a partial panel failure, it's a vacuum failure. So the attitude indicator starts slowly failing, as it does if attitude indicator vacuum pump system fails. The CFII start turning the airplane in the direction of attitude indicator, 
Within a few minutes, crash to plane. And the CFII goes, Jen, what did she do? What's this crazy failure you gave me? She said, it's just a vacuum failure. <laughs> so if that CFII, who was supposed to be teaching instrument pilots, was constantly scanning, they would detect that there's a partial panel, that an attitude indicator is suddenly saying a different thing than the turn coordinator, saying different things than the GPS, saying different things than the needle, desired track and track, all these little cues, they would know, wait a minute, this is unreliable. They take out a post note, cover that, and the flight would have been safe. I recommend my students to fly with post-it notes. In case one of your instruments fail, you need to cover that because it's very disorienting when there's a failed instrument and it's telling you different things. So bring post-it notes and be ready. In case something fails, constantly be scanning. <clears throat> Remember the three keys, okay? This is, if I only teach you one thing out of this whole series, remember the three keys. Left or right is your primary, your first order of business. Don't fly into mountains. High or low, make sure you get <laughs> higher than the minimum so you don't hit any terrain and control that speed. Uh, Multi-engine students struggle a lot with this. Uh, also, complex high-performance instrument, complex, and high performance instrument students also struggle with this because the plane is fast. And if you don't control your speed, you will blow this approach really easily. So in multi-engine training, a lot of time I have to go back to instrument training okay, and teaching them how to control energy, how to control speed. So you gotta keep these three keys in mind. All right, so let's talk about the departure. Any questions so far online, in person? Good. Okay, thank you <laughs> uh, for monitoring. Let's talk about the departure. So there's several ways you can get out of Monterey. I tell my students, if you're gonna land at an airport, make sure you can get out of it. <laughs> for example, you might be able to fly an instrument approach into Aspen, Colorado at 172 maybe, but it might be really hard to get out of it. And make sure you look at the approach and the departure. Monterey is relatively um, not a problem getting out. But here's the procedure. If you're taking off runway 28, you're going to climb heading 278 until you get to 1,100 feet, and then you're going to turn right 329er. I've flown with a CFII who flew the departure procedure. They turn left instead of right and got a pilot deviation. So be really careful briefing your departure. Make sure you turn the correct direction. Um, if you're departing runway 10, you are climbing and then doing a left turn heading 329er. When do you start turning? Does anyone know in the chat box or online? Online in the chat box or in person? Yes. 500 feet uh, GL. 400 feet AGL, according to Zaheem, is when you would begin your turn. So you got to note what is the airport elevation, right? Part of your departure briefing is my airport elevation, let's say in this scenario, because Monterey have different altitude, depending on which runway you're taking off, one is lower than the other. But let's say the runway that you're taking off, the elevation is 200 feet. You're going to brief, okay. I'm taking off elevation 200 feet, 400 AGL, so my altimeter is going to reach 600 feet. When I see 600 feet, then make my turn. And that's when I would do a climbing left turn, 329er, if I'm doing runway 10. Uh, if I'm doing runway 28, my approach, my departure briefing would be all right, I'm taking off, I'm climbing, heading 278. I'm waiting 1,100 feet before I turn right. I don't turn early. Okay. Any questions on that? Why the strange turn? Because of this. Monterey Regional Airport is located in what we call a rich area, <laughs> rich people area. They don't <laughs> like you flying over their house. 
that annoys them. So there are noise abatement procedures. And in general, the procedure is you fly straight, and then at a certain altitude or distance from a runway, turn away into the coast, away from the rich people house, right? So that's, <laughs> that's the truth. But that's the departure procedure. Uh, the other procedure that you might fly, most people will get a Monterey 5. So expect that, especially if you're in a GA aircraft. In some rare occasions, you might get a Toro 7, or if you're flying different kind of aircraft, not a single engine or a small trainer aircraft, multi-engine plane, you might get a Toro 7. Now, the key to Toro 7 to note is you can only take off runway 10. You cannot take off runway 28, and you need a standard minimum climb of 449 feet. So earlier, we were briefing our climb performance in a 172 is in the 300 zone. So we're definitely not doing the 207. Do not accept this if your aircraft can't do this climb. Um, and then another thing to note is there is a loss comm procedure if you're doing this 207, but it's saying, if you don't hear anything, fly towards Salinas, okay? And then climb. Other procedures to get out of Monterey that you might not get on an IFR flight plan, you might have to request it. Um, definitely ODP is something that you would request, is the ODP, and you can read the departure procedures, it tells you what heading, when to turn, and then what route to fly, or you may get radar vector. Radar vector is when ATC tell you exactly how to get out of the airport. But in general, expect Monterey 5. This is a favorite IFR question on a favorite DP question on IFR check right. What is DER? Any, yes. I was going to say something at the end of the runway. Yes. Uh, distance mm -hmm. above the end of the runway. Right. So this is the gotcha question. Some people think, oh, DER is a VOR because it's three letters, or maybe it's a fix. No, DER, when you read a handbook, departure and runway. So when you're reading obstacle notes, we're going to go back here, it tells you, Bushes begin 1.6 nautical mile from departure and of runway. At this altitude, left of center line, it's telling you how to avoid obstacles. Okay, so know what that means. Any questions online? There was one. If we accept the Monterey 5 departure as assigned, we are obligated to fly to Shuey. Uh, do you recommend flying all the way out to Shuey, which may be beyond gliding distance from the airplane? For your same legend, what about refusing that SID in lieu of somebody else? Uh, I just I say I recommend careful planning, uh, good observation, but also looking at the other option you have available a visual climb over the airport, the other obstacle departure procedures instead of the standard instrument, the SIDs. So there's a lot of factors in there, and that just comes from looking at your options prior to if you don't feel comfortable taking off directly over the water and remain beyond a comfortable personal choice. So for our online for the recording, um, Taylor said the question is, uh, looking at the Monterey 5 departure, the, and if you're taken off, it eventually put you at Shui. Would you accept it? Because it might be beyond your fighting distance. And Taylor says that depending on the context, uh, you can see that there's different options, the ODP, or the radar vectors. But what I can tell you is generally when you're given a Monterey 5 departure, as soon as you take off, you get to 1,100 feet, you turn right for a few minutes, um, and you're still within a coastline, you're already getting radar vector. I've never flown this departure where I've had to fly all the way towards Shui. I then turn radar vector much earlier than that when I'm well along the coastline. Uh, the other thing you can say is request, tell ATC, hey, I'm not comfortable flying that far out in coastline. Can I stay inland? And we actually did that on a flight toward LA. So toward LA, Taylor and I was flying with our instrument student. And the IFR clearance would put us 
away from the coastline, a few miles over the ocean, and we told ATC, hey, you know, I am not comfortable flying over the water away from my line distance. Can I just stay close to the coastline? And ATC say, yes, you can fly along the coastline, and that's exactly what we did. So you can always ask, um, know what all your different options are, and then in general, for me, in my experience, I've never had to go that far. They usually radar back to me much earlier. All right, so which route would I file? And this will come in to lost comp scenario, which we'll talk about next. But the route that I would file is Monterey, if I'm going back to Reed Hillview, to Salinas toward Gilroe, because I want Gilroe, my last fix, to be an initial approach fix to a plate. And we'll talk about why that matters in a minute. So my clearance might be clear to Reed Hillview Airport via departure by Monterey 5, Salinas, Gilro, direct, climb via SID, 5,000, expect 7,000, five minutes departure frequency, 127.15, SWAC 4520. Okay. Now here's my shorthand. Always plan out how you're going to write shorthand. I fly with a lot of instrument rated pilot or students who have gibberish handwriting. They write all this gibberish and then they look at me and they go, what was the clearance? I go, that was your job. <laughs> okay, You're supposed to copy that down. So practice your handwriting and shorthand. Write as little as possible. That way your gibberish is not so much <laughs> that you have to interpret what you just wrote. Uh, capital letters helps. Giving yourself lots of spacing help. Don't write small letters. That usually ends up into, I can't read this number. Is it a five or is it an eight? Okay, so let's go to last com scenario. Rule number one, avoid last com. <laughs> and you can do that by monitoring your amp meter. We had a pilot who had last com in the soup and they flew the instrument approach using four flight. That is a no-no. <laughs> okay, four flight is not designed to fly the instrument approach. You got to use your GPS or navigate system. But always keep monitoring your ammeter and make sure that it stay positive. Number two, have a handheld radio. If you know that you're going to actual IMC, which I always do, have a Bluetooth headset. I like my Bose A20. Works great for me. There are other kind of wonderful noise canceling Bluetooth headset that allows me to call through my phone. Uh, we've done that a few times, just getting IFR clearance, call on the phone through the Bluetooth headset. It sounds fabulous on the Bose A20, but I'm sure it sounds great for other headsets as well. And then call or text. You have your cell phone, right? So don't just think, oh, I've lost my radio. I've lost everything. Game over. <laughs> um, one thing to note is when I'm flying actual IMC, and I talked about this last class, is I always bring two pilot with me, an instrument rated proficient current pilot, and I divide a workload. Pilot flying, pilot monitoring. In the scenario of the lost comm or workload is really high, Right? This pilot monitoring is making radio calls, retrieving information, using the backup radio handheld system, right? using the Bluetooth headset, calling, texting people on the, on the phone. Here's a great story that I recommend that you watch. It's on AOPA. It's a 21 minutes, 50 seconds video on YouTube. And you can get, I think, credit with the AOPA. It's a real pilot story. So, Instrument rated commercial pilot. He's flying at night into thick IMC. He has a full electrical failure. No radios, no GPS, no transponder, nothing. And so he was describing his video like there was a moment where I just gave up. I didn't know what to do. What HTC did for him, they tracked down his tail number, they found out who owned an airplane, then they look on um, online to find his phone number as he's a doctor or you know some like profession where his phone number was online and then you were texting him 
instructions. And because of that, he saved them. And so watch this video, a great scenario, like food for thought on what are you gonna do if you're flying in thick IMC. Here are my rules of thumb. Dick Chang told me this is my CFWI. He said, pick one, night, IMC, or mountains, pick one, <laughs> okay? When you start mixing them, you're increasing your risk. And then this is what Taylor told me today. He heard on a video, don't do anything dumb, different, or dangerous. <laughs> okay. So we'll go through lots calm, and we'll keep these ideas in mind. Um, but when it comes to departure, if there are some departure plates that tells you what to do in last com, like we mentioned earlier, the Toro 7, if you have last com, you're flying to Salinas and then via your assigned fix and maintain 7,000. But if your departure plate doesn't have last com, these are the favorite DP questions. What are you going to do when you have last com? Rule number one. Don't have last con. <laughs> Bring your backup. Rule number two, know the regulations and know what's possible. So here's my IFR clearance. Let's say from clear to read who you, Monterey 5, Salinas, Gilroy, direct. Climb via the SID 5,000, expect 7,000 in five minutes. <clears throat> Rule number one is you got to know your terrain, okay? Know that mountains is south of you, north is flatland. Here is what the aim says, and I'm also going to show you what the regulation says, which is 91, 185. But here's the aim. It is virtually impossible to provide regulation procedures applicable to all possible situations. So I can't tell you what to do always in all lost comm scenario. That's my disclaimer. Use your ADM. But... The aim says, this is coming from FA, should the situation so dictate, pilots should not be reluctant to use emergency action contained in 91.3. 91.3 says, pilot can deviate from any rule to the extent required to meet emergency. So that's your get out of jail card. The last comm scenario, you can determine, right? The aim says, whether two-way communication constitute emergency depends on circumstance, and in any event, is a determination by the pilot. So if you have a lost comm, you get to decide whether it's emergency or not emergency. And if you decide it's emergency, get out jail free card. You can deviate from any rule. But if you're going to do that, be smart about it. So <laughs> know where the terrain is. Um, and also know how the system works. So we'll talk about how it works. Um, here is the regulation. This is the DP favorite question. So know the regulation and know what you're going to do in real life. Plan for it before you even take off. <clears throat> so rule number one, don't have lost comm. Rule number two is if you do have lost comm, find a VFR airport and continue flight under VFR land as soon as practical. Now, this is a note in the aim. The primary objective is to preclude, which is to avoid extended IFR operation by these aircraft in ATC system. So ATC wants you to get out. <laughs> okay. If you have last comm, get out of the SUV, fly to VFR as soon as possible. That's what they want. And then it says, but it's not intended to say that you need to land as soon as possible, it's just as soon as practical. So you get to retain the prerogative of exercising your best judgment and don't land. You're not required to land at an unauthorized airport, an airport not suitable for your aircraft or land immediately. It's just as soon as practical. All right, so rule number three. So number one, don't have lost phones. <laughs> have backups. Number two, go to VFR condition. Number three, yes. There's one more thing to avoid uh, lost comms is check the uh, I don't think, uh, I think a lot of people are not aware of the fact that there are wicks um, on the surfaces to, to avoid the uh, precipitation static, especially. And a lot of our planes, like they have, they have one wick or no wicks remaining. It's, it's good to know before 
for going into the Zoom. <laughs> so the comment in, in person is check your static wicks as well, because that could affect your electrical system. Awesome, thank you. So if you can go to a VFR airport, uh, we call this Avenue FMEA. So according to the regulation route, you do it in order. You either fly the route that was assigned. If you are being vectored, then you fly it being radar vectored by direct route from the point radio failure to the fixed route or airway specified in the vector clearance. Or you would fly what is expected. Like if they say expect this route later on, or you fly what's filed. So sign vector expected file. In this case, we would fly to Salinas, then Giro, and we fly the instrument approach into Reed Hill. Here's the altitude. Um, the altitude is MEA. So this is the highest of whether whatever you're assigned, the minimum altitude for your high up our operation. So a lot of the time people think the minimum altitude is the MEA. It's not true. It's the minimum altitude of whatever segment you're on, which might not always be the MEA. If you're off segment, it could be MSA, it could be an Aroca, right? So the minimum altitude for whatever, wherever you are, whatever operation, whatever phase of flight, or the highest expected. And here's the note. If you receive an expected further clearance containing a higher altitude, like if we're cleared 5,000, expect 7,000 after five minutes, then you are expected to fly the highest of the last assigned altitude or the minimum altitude for the operation. And then when you reach the time limit, then commence climbing to altitude advice. And I've talked to ATC NorCal about this. In general, they're expecting you to hold Climb to 5,000, hold it, wait five minutes, then climb 7,000 feet. But they would not be surprised if you just keep climbing to 7,000 feet, which is your highest assigned. And that is higher than any um, minimum altitude along the route as well. So by regulations, you would fly, climb 5,000, wait five minutes, climb 7,000 feet. But if you start climbing 7,000 feet, ATC would not be surprised by that. The reason why there's usually time limit is because ATC is transitioning different jets around. And so they're wanting to hold you at low altitude until you reach a certain distance. And then they want you to climb so that you're not in the way of inbound traffic. But if you start losing lost calm, your aircraft becomes like this crazy lit up airplane in the radar system and their eyes are on you. <laughs> you know? So they start focusing and making sure that they clear everyone out of your way. Yes. So what about the 7600? Seven, so you could. If your electrical system still works, you would swap 7600, right? 7500 is hijack, man with a knife. 75, man with a knife. 76, get your radio fixed. 77, falling from heaven. So, and last comes 7600 uh, is what you would swap if you still have electrical. And that sends out an alert in the radar system. And oftentimes, in NorCal, they would have one person and maybe the supervisor focused on that one particular aircraft and they put another controller to focus on the other aircraft, start vectoring everyone out of the way. Um, one thing to note is if you're flying from Monterey to Salinas to Gilro, there is no MEA along this route. So how do you know how high the minimum IFR altitude is? Uh, I've discussed this with DPs, and they tell me that you will look at the routes close by and look at what the MEA close by. So if you are looking at HENS, you might see that it's 4,700 GOF, that's the uh, GPS. If you have GPS, you can identify that. You might look at the Tango 259 route, 
and the ME is 5,000 feet. So you would know, and if you are a local Bay Area pilot flying out of Monterey, you know that if you're 7,000 feet, you're pretty much clear of most terrain as long as you follow your course left or right. Um, now this is the gotcha that DP will get people <laughs> on an IFR check right is when do you leave the clearance limit? This is why I would file from Monterey to Salinas to Gilroe, my initial approach fix. Because of the clearance limit is a fix from which an approach begins. Then I can begin the approach. But step I, if it's not a fix from which an approach begins, like if I'm just clear to read Hoville, then according to the regulation, you're expected to fly over Reed Hill View, 7,000 feet, come out again, go back to the initial approach fix, Gilro, and come back in again. Well, that sometimes is really long, goes the wrong direction, you're in the suit for a longer amount of time. And so in general, it's a good practice when you're following to follow with the initial approach fix. Uh, in general, if you're flying a bigger plane, faster airplane, the IFR clearance would give you an arrival, and the arrival would ends with a fix. That fix is usually the beginning of an approach plate. Um, so ATC generally expect that jet aircraft coming in arrival, getting to the fix, coming into land. Now I talked to NorCal, and they also sent out a question. There is a Facebook group called The Landline. The Landline is a forum where air traffic controllers from across the country will chime in. And they asked this question of, well, do you expect the pilot to begin the approach and come in and land, or do you want them to go over the airport and then come out and then fly the approach and land? And in general, the ATC wants you to get out of the way. <laughs> okay. So they want you to fly the initial approach, fix, and land. But just know that according to the regulation, if you weren't clear for that initial approach fix, the regulation says you fly to your clearance limit, which is usually your airport, then go to initial approach fix and come in and land. Any questions on that? Now, of course, if that seems crazy, you can exercise 91.3. Declare that this is lost calm emergency and you are just going to fly the approach and land. Um, one question that a lot of IFR students ask me is, what's up with this time? Expect for a clearance time or estimated time of arrival. Um, you want to note that the IFR system is designed not only for little baby GA aircraft, but it's also, also for jets and big airliners as well. And certain airports have what's called flow time. For example, if I'm flying to San Diego, Las Vegas, um, Vancouver, we had this, LA, there's a flow time. And we were given um, a time in which we can depart to sequence all the jets that are coming into that airport. So you don't want to be the one plane that's cutting in line in front of everyone, busting through the airport and landing. Um, that could cause a air traffic control nightmare, right? You want to do it at your flow time. But in general, in GA aircraft, that's good practice. And generally, by the time you reach your initial approach fix, that's your estimated time of arrival anyway, because your speed is not going to change dramatically. Like your maximum speed is maybe 100 knots. That's probably full throttle. But in a jet, a full throttle can go anywhere from 400, 500 knots to, well, zero. <laughs> so this expected time is to make sure that you, if you are flying a plane that has a wide range of speed that you can fly, that you are, you know, flying within your flow time, within your expected time, so that you're not cutting in front of other aircrafts. But know that in emergency, right, a lost comm could be emergency. And point three. Any questions on that last comm? 
So your second code phrase is plan your outs. So always know your outs. The first one is IFR personal minimums. Is your first code second code phrase is plan your outs. Always think, what am I going to do in an emergency? Because if you haven't planned for it, you don't have peace of mind. You're going to be flying nervous all the time, like, I don't know. And when the moment happens, you may or may not make the right decision. But if on the ground, you think things through A, B, C, D. If this happened, I do this. If this happened, I do that. And you're very clear on that. And when it happens, you're just executing. You're not sitting duck thinking things through. Because in general, they say that if emergency happened, it takes the pilot some time to figure out what had happened, right? When we're flying in a jet and I'm flying an autopilot, when the autopilot start veering off course or breaking off from the iOS, it took us five, six seconds to figure out, wait a minute, we're not flying where we're supposed to be flying. ATC caught it right away the moment we figure it out but it takes us some moments to figure that out we just connect the autopilot put the plane back to where it's supposed to be but you always want to have backups know your outs all right so that concludes <laughs> the presentation um, if you want FAA wings credit or provide comments uh, my hope is i could do a wing seminar once or twice every month just to keep engagement with the pilot community. Um, then in the Google form, I'm asking if you have any ideas on what you think would be a topic you'd be interested in. These are always, of course, free. You can get your wings credit there, send me your email, send me any comments or feedback, bit.ly slash IFR Monterey. And if you have any questions, um, you can email me, at gmail.com. The recording of this, session is going to be posted on youtube in a few days whenever i figure out that <laughs> any questions yes could we have the slide deck for this and the previous one as well not the recording but just the slide deck yeah so if you want a copy of the slide deck send me an email okay um, and always a disclaimer is use the most updated fa procedures whenever you're flying it, because by the time I finish this conversation, they might have changed it already. Any other questions online or in person? Comments? Good. All right, thank you for attending. Um, we have the holiday party at five, if anyone wants to stick around. And I'll see everyone next time for What's in Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys online, thanks for attending.